Saturday, while I was frantically preparing for this weekend, I was very excited to come across a website owned by the Bodosakis Foundation, which is a high-profile educational charity based in Greece. The website hosts international academic lectures and conference videos from across the spectrum of the sciences and humanities. In its mission statement, it notes that its ambition is to form a true crossroads of interdisciplinary dialogue and to offer the insights gleaned in closed conference halls and classrooms to a broader public audience. Two items in particular caught my eye. The first was a collection of talks from an international conference that took place in Athens last summer this summer, this past summer, entitled Philosophy, Politics, and Finance in the Era of Globalization. As you can imagine, Athens needs this right now. And another was called Leadership and Management in a Changing World, Lessons from Ancient Eastern and Western Philosophy. This one featured a number of discussions of platonic thought vis-a-vis -vis modern political dilemmas, as well as comparative analyses of Confucian thought from platonic perspectives. A third conference was called Art and Education, Creative Ways of Teaching Languages. Two lecture titles that stood out here were, quote, Do you speak music in your classroom? Conditions and ideas for solid teaching and learning. And another one, Techniques for Contemplative, Creative and Linguistic Motivation of Students through the Arts, Theoretical and Practical Approaches. Now, the reason I was so excited to discover this website was because it embodied precisely the concept driving the Phoenix Rising Academy, and which brought us here today. The questions we're here to discuss are twofold. Firstly, and I think we've accomplished that, to an extent at least, is to take a fresh look at whether the methodologies we utilize are sufficient, or whether they are in danger of stifling or truncating the very subject they were designed to illuminate by keeping certain experiential perspectives and epistemologies outside the scope of exploration. Some scholars may believe that we're t tilting at windmills here, that we're quixotically reopening a subject that has been resolved long ago. Others may wonder whether we are in fact debating a non-issue, as it was recently pointed out to me, and this is what makes me realize that cultural background of scholarship has a lot to do with it. Um, this issue that we're debating here, uh, and that may be current and important in the European academic setting, does not necessarily apply to perspectives on this side of the Atlantic. These are question marks. Be that as it may, in both cases, my reasoning lies in the second issue that I wish to raise, and which is so beautifully represented by the mission statement of the Bodo Science Foundation, as well as many of the conference topics it features. If these topics are only discussed in conference halls and classrooms at advanced and theoretical academic levels, and if they provide only the most sanitized... That is where we begin to find a curious kind of link in terms of the form of thought. To begin to bridge the perceptual divide, we need to begin by fostering an environment within which these ideas can regain their meaningfulness. And to do that, we need to look at the worldview within which these traditions emerged and evolved. When speaking of an appropriate environment and worldview, I am not speaking of some revivalist tradition, I am speaking of a mental and intellectual environment. This does not bring me to a romantic revisioning of the past, but to the model of classical education. Grammar, the first lesson of the trivium, was first developed by poets in ancient Greece in order to help speakers of the common tongue understand the poetic language of Homer. Try telling that to a first-year grammar, and a six-year-old try to learn grammar. That it, in fact, was the key to poetry, known as the art of grammar, later called Yanua Artia, meaning the gate of arts, the gates of the arts, the concept of grammar was always closely related to the creative arts because it provided a frame of reference to exercise and expand the mind towards its creative possibilities. Rhetoric, or the art of oral persuasion, takes note of the differentiation between written and spoken expression, and beyond the actual skills it imparts, including the use of allegory and metaphor, it is an exercise in consciousness, self-awareness, and analytical thought and expression. 
logic at this level sets the ground rules for the study of philosophy. We can say that logic is to philosophy what grammar is to language. And then curiously, all four of the quadrivium subjects inherently incorporate the philosophical and metaphysical bases for what we now call the esoteric traditions. Mathematics and abstract mathematics inherently include a philosophical component. Plato himself had a morning carved up above the entrance to his academy. Let no one enter here without geometry. Since for Plato, philosophy, cosmology, and geometry were inseparable. And reading Plato without a practical and philosophical understanding of geometry may leave more gaps in our understanding of his real work than we know. Of music, I shall say little, apart from noting that of all the art forms, it was considered the most ethereal and magical because, because it was considered able to move, as well as for its harmonic and mathematical properties. And finally, astronomy served to place man in the universe, at once observer, recorder, creator, and guardian of nature. As a form of education, this is the model and set of principles that liberal arts colleges were founded on, and from which current economic conditions are now forcing them to move away. There is still a dissonance, there is a fatal flaw in my argumentation, which I have not yet addressed, and which has been aptly identified by Professor Hanegraaff as the profoundest of ironies, the fact that, and I quote, the 19th and 20th century representatives of Western esotericism are largely so deeply influenced by the very world views to which they object that what they present as enchanted alternatives turn out, in fact, to be products of the secularization process. This is absolutely true. And it is also true of our educational system. But does that mean that my call for a re-examination of the liberal arts as a model of ed education, underpinning the core esoteric notion of self-awareness and self-determination, is just one more religionist and utopian dream? Yeah. Hardly religionist, I would venture. Philosophist, perhaps. But then I'm not going to argue with Plato and Socrates. But, is it utopian? It might be if we were to advocate some kind of return to the glorious past, which would represent the first naivete of Paul Ricoeur's system of hermeneutics. But if we accept this, and choose instead to use the academic tools at our disposal, imbued with the spirit of rationalism, we still remain at the first naivete because we are continuing to take a rationalist approach to material which is patently irrational. Naturally, these are good tools for the historiography of esotericism and discourse analysis, but in that case, we are not scholars of esotericism at all, but scholars of a specific historical niche or a particular type of discourse. So here's the problem, here's the conundrum. We have a set of neglected cultural currents without which our general understanding of Western history and culture is incomplete on several fundamental levels. Academic attempts to explore and reinstate them in our collective corpus of knowledge are slow, painstaking, in some respects unable to fully do them justice, in others more damaging than good, particularly when these topics are only made available at advanced academic levels, although they belong in undergraduate classrooms alongside history, literature and art, perhaps even the history of science. In a way, one could almost say that secondary teachers need retraining in some of these respects to incorporate, I've already taught this in secondary classrooms, I call it history of course, um, but who's, who's the wiser? So practical and individual approaches to these topics are unlikely to have it, I'm not going to have a big influence doing that, I'll influence my classroom, that's it, perhaps. So. Practical and individual approaches aren't going to have a great influence. They're often likely to lack method or reflect more subjective solipsistic interpretations. This keeps the esoteric traditions outside of mainstream culture, outside mainstream academia, in its capacity, uh, in their capacity as other. In a situation perpetuated by the way of thinking that divided its worldviews from each other in the first place. Keeping its study in the highest echelons of academia, even if it's only for practical reasons, even if that is the only reason, fuels accusations of elitism. It supports um, calls for anti-intellectualism and the shunning of academic perspectives altogether. 
I see two ways out of this conundrum, and they are both based on the premise that within the history and content of the West Mediterranean currents are embedded models and ideas that we can learn from, and which can offer far-reaching, practical, and pragmatic ways in which to counter the social, moral, and existential crisis we are all experiencing, whether from the eye of the storm or from the sidelines. The first of these models is that of education that I have already raised. It is also my conviction that when they are so inclined, scholars in particular have a duty to communicate, disseminate, discuss these models and their potential applications. Scholars who have the privilege of understanding how these concepts work need to leave their ivory towers and talk both to their more positivist colleagues as well as their objects of study and, pardon the pun, the uninitiated. Practitioners who wish to join into this dialogue need to root philosophical and enchanted ideals in modern reality. It is esotericism that can provide a common vocabulary and vision. From there on, we need to talk to each other, assuming, of course, that we agree that right now, the world could use some improvement. If scholars remain ensconced in libraries and conference halls such as this one, practitioners remain fixated on high-minded discussion and defense of their individual belief systems, and armchair occultists continue to disseminate misperceptions, then all of us together remain part of the problem. In her 2010 presidential address to the, AA, to the American Academy of Religion, published in this summer's journal of the AAR, Anne Taves made the following point. Rather than simply borrowing theories and methods from other disciplines and turning our departments into fragmented microcosms of the larger university, I think we can take advantage of the fact that we can approach our object of study at many different levels of analysis and take up the challenge of figuring out how we might relate explanations generated at different levels of analysis. In the same issue of the same journal, another author notes the following point in an article entitled, quote, Embodied Research and Writing, a case for phenomenologically oriented religious studies ethnographies. Quote, the body can be a vehicle for complicating, at times transcending, emicondetic boundaries. To ignore our embodied interactions with others in the field when we write is to occlude lived experience and how our bodies are epistemological sites that allow us privileged access into our interlocutors' worlds. End quote. I am not proposing that we should use Ricoeur's method of hermeneutics as he used it, nor as it was adapted for use in theological hermeneutics. And I do believe that matters of personal belief, personal prejudice, overly subjective interpretation have no place in the classroom, nor do personal politics. That does not mean they should not be talked about, I return to what Amy said in the first presentation, and that we should not explore germane ways to make use of the insights gleaned from closer interaction with these ideas. Nor is the fear of this occurring, or precedence belonging to a different time, a sufficient reason to avoid re-examining from new perspectives. All teachers inevitably bring their life experience into the classroom, whether they are aware of it or not, and the more self-aware they are, the better teachers they tend to be. We would not bat an eyelid at an art historian who is also an artist, bringing his own aesthetic perspective or artistic imagination to bear in the classroom. We would not think twice about a musicologist who is also a musician using her performance experience to clarify elements of composition. If anything, their practice of these intangible arts of the imagination will make them better teachers. Nor is there a problem with using the language and hermeneutic devices of diverse philosophical perspectives in order to explore aesthetic nuance. Likewise with literature and concepts ranging from the postmodern sublime to the semiotics of poetry. Multiple conferences on education are organized annually in which both theoreticians, administrators, and teachers at all levels discuss and exchange ideas. The latter basing their expertise on their classroom experience, which has a bearing both on the further development of theory and of management. The administrators, is the, excuse me, the approach of each of these professions incorporates a legitimate epistemology that the theoreticians is based on psychological, pedagogical, and statistical research. The administrators is based on mainly practical considerations such as finance and logistics. And the teachers is experiential first and foremost. A good a teacher need not be a good theorist, but she does need to learn from experience and implement that experience in the future. 
and both administrators and theoreticians must hear that experience if they are to help and not hinder the educational process, which is often enough like being on stage without a script, especially when teaching younger age groups. It is the experienced teacher who must, must be able to translate theoretical models and practical concerns into a classroom setting and communicate that classroom reality back to the theoreticians hidden in offices and libraries. Likewise, in the medical field, both clinicians and practitioners frequently gather to exchange findings. There is a tension between them too. Since although the findings of clinicians may rest on empirical bases, it is the practitioners who know what no meta-analysis can demonstrate. Alone, they can only perform half a task. I dread to think of the bedside manner of clinicians, whose valuable work on the other hand serves both as quality control and as a constant learning tool for medical practitioners seeking to develop and improve their field. Finally, coming full circle to the Bodo Psychis Foundation website where I started, it is hardly surprising that while Greece is in the throes of financial and socio-political crisis, the Athens School of Economics summoned political philosophers in an attempt to redefine re possible <laughs> well, <you said>, uh, <laughs> redefine and redefine the possible applications of Platonic thought to the current situation. A naive approach would quote the Republic verbatim, possibly call for synarchic rule by philosophers. In fact, some people already are. I'll be talking about that this afternoon. Um, but passed through a critical lens while maintaining the essence of Platonic philosophy and adapted to modern considerations. The result here was a series of presentations that produced thoughtful and applicable suggestions for management, governance, and economic protocols that take social cohesion and the human element into account, and all of which made abundantly clear that technocratic number crunching is not the way forward when governing or educating people rather than numbers or studying people. Therefore, in summary, I hope I have clarified the points and, in essence, proposal being made here. Firstly, the humanities and education in general is in danger of becoming ever more commercialized and ever more an elite luxury. Secondly, esotericism belongs in the corpus of cultural knowledge just as much as any other branch of the humanities. If I can teach it in literature class, if I can get away with it in English language, as a, English as a second language class, surely there must be ways. Thirdly, there are numerous precedents in other areas of the humanities that support the case for interdisciplinary borrowing, as well as for the acceptable acknowledgement and use of experiential learning alongside theory. There are paradigms and precedents for this. Fourthly, esotericism as a corpus of knowledge is in a position to offer models and paradigms that can be of use in a modern setting, provided, much like the political philosophy uh, conference, that they are viewed through a combined lens that takes their full nature into account and modern reality into account. Fifth, as a field it is necessary to reach out and translate academies into a more accessible kind of language, if for no other reason than to counterbalance the continuing misconceptions that led to terrorism to be stigmatized in the first place. And finally, that as scholars we have a duty to bring this area of study to a wider audience. Not least because if it remains shut away in the ivory towers of academia, it will remain other, and it will wither as a field if the state of the humanities continues to devolve as it is currently doing. And if that occurs, it will be the practitioners and not the scholars who keep these currents alive. It is for this reason that at Phoenix Rising Academy, we are calling for dialogue. We're laying out a table and saying, let's sit down, and see what we can learn from each other, how we can make our collective knowledge, perspectives, myriad cultural, intellectual, philosophical, experiential perspectives count for something. It is to this end that today's session is organized. It is in this spirit that we can intend to continue. Thank you very, very much.